to the issue at hand tonight. Tonight, we're going to do two things. We're going to do the unit testing of the timesheet list controller that we built two weeks ago. Okay? And we're also going to, remember that's very important because that unit test is going to test our controller. So far we have only done unit tests on our managers. That's it. Tonight we're going to cover how to do a unit test in, against the controller. And then the second thing that we're going to do on the second video lecture is going to be the enter hours controller. How different is it? the timesheet list controller, which was a very simple controller, versus the enter hours where you are actually entering data, asking data from the user, and you are grabbing it, validating it, massaging it, and then saving it into the database. Does it work? Now, what I want you to do is keep updating your wiki. Because I'm going to go, I'm going to always go against the wiki. Um, I have seen some of you guys' wikis. Let's take a look at mine. Okay? As you can see, I have prioritized the user stories. We completed the first one. What was the first one? Timesheet list, right? An employee can see a list of timesheets previously, previously entered and click the ones that can be modified. So pretty much we did that last week or two weeks ago. Then the second in the priority is enter hours. A user can enter hours worked and save this data or cancel and nothing is saved. Enter hours is not telling me, hey, the, 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 the user is the first time that it's creating the, the, the uh, timesheet. Therefore, it's entering hours. Or it's not saying, it's not being specific about, oh, it was rejected by the boss and now it has to modify the hours and enter them again. Doesn't matter. I don't care. It's enter hours, it's one functionality. I don't care if this is the first time that it, the employee is entering the hours or this is the fifth time in the week that the employee is entering the hours. The idea is to enter the hours. Period. Oh, but, but, but now it's modifying them. I don't care. It's enter hours. So I do not want to see something like this. Enter expenses. An employee enter expenses and saves data. And then he has another one. Continue entering expenses. An employee can continue with an expense report that has been saved. Or not. Fis fix enter expenses. An employee can attempt to fix an expense report that has been rejected by his manager. To me, all of these are one and the same user story. Okay? I do not want to see user stories that are put in different terms when the functionality bottom line is the same because it's not going to count as a separate user story. To me, these four user stories are one and the same. Enter expenses. Period. Thing. This is the last version of our project. This is the one that I posted online so you guys can download it and import it into your Eclipse and play with it. You guys remember, I created an all tasks class. And all tasks created a suite of tasks. So I had one for time sheet manager test. And I had another one for department manager test. Right? Well now, I'm also going to have controller tests. See, this suite, I call it the model test, or the manager test. I should Managers. 
tests. Okay. Now I'm going to create another one. And this one is going to be called the controller tests. Okay. It's another suite. And I'm going to control, I'm going to create that controller test suite. The first one is going to be the timesheet list controller test, which I haven't created yet. Right? That's why it shows that there's an error there. And then at the end, the full suite. Remember, this is a composition, a composite pattern, a composition of suites. This full suite, which I call the all tests, is going to incorporate not only the model test suite, which is the one that were the managers, but also the controller test suite for the controllers. That's what I want you to do. Okay? So when I run all tests, it's going to run all the unit tests for all your managers and immediately after all the unit tests for all your controllers. Good. Now let's build the timesheet list controller test. Before we do that, let's take a look at the timesheet list controller. What are we trying to test? In fact, it's the only controller that we have. Let's go back and review a little bit about the timesheet list controller. Okay, I remember now. This guy implemented from a controller, which is an interface, remember? And this interface had to implement, had to actually create code, that's what implement means, create code for handle request function. It's a function that returns a model in view. And it has its parameters, the request and the response. The HTTP request and the HTTP response. You guys remember what we did in the handle, the request? Where you say, hey, timesheet manager, and I don't care where the timesheet manager was coming from. I didn't, the timesheet list controller didn't have the responsibility of creating a timesheet manager. It just uses the timesheet manager says, hey, timesheet manager, get me the timesheets for employee D1. Gets back a list. And what does it return? It returns a new model in view with three things. The success view, which is this function here. Get success view. A map key which it's hard-coded, constant to timesheets, and then the actual list of timesheets. That's the model and view. Very simple. Okay? So that's, in essence, what we have to test. We have to test that this controller, when it sees timesheet list that HTM in the URL, will take control. And it will grab the timesheet manager, get a whole bunch of timesheets, and then provide the model in view. That's what we have to test. In other words, we have to test the fact that the timesheet list controller is doing its job. How do we do that? Uh, what's the purpose of the Mac key? This is a parameter. And in fact, we could have just, to make things even easier, we could have just done this. What is it doing? It's actually passing. You guys remember in PHP, you guys remember uh, hashes? What was a hash? Name value pairs. Name value. So you had a name and its associated value. And the value could be objects, lists, arrays. It could be anything in PHP. That was the beauty of it. In Java, it's not so easy. In Java, you actually have to make a little bit more effort to 
play with hashes. It has the class hash, obviously. In here, that's what we're doing. We're creating a hash with name timesheets. And the value of that hash is the list of timesheets that came back from the timesheet manager. That's what we're doing. We're actually creating a hash. Got it? And that hash is going to be sent to this view. But that view, we don't have it hard coded, right? We don't have that view hard coded. We're actually getting it from this getter, which is returning us this success view, which is a property. So who is populating that property? This is going back to the XML. You guys remember the servlet XML configuration? That's the XML that Spring uses here it is that's the XML that Spring uses to configure stuff so if you take a look at the timesheet list controller bean it's injecting two things it's injecting the timesheet manager which has as a reference another bean this bean Okay, so basically Spring is going to load into memory a timesheet manager and have it readily available for anybody to use. And when somebody says, hey, inject it in here, it's going to take that timesheet manager and it's going to inject it into this property. So the timesheet list controller has a timesheet manager property, which will get that timesheet manager being injected into it. And the same thing happens with the property success view. The timesheet list controller has a property called success view, which will get a specific value injected into it. In this case, it's not a reference to another bean, it's an actual value. What's the value? T I M E S H E E T T L I S T. The word timesheet list. So that's what gets injected. That's why we have to have a getter. I mean, sorry, a setter. So that it can get injected into the timesheet list manager. Same thing with the timesheet manager. It has to have a setter. Okay? So, back to the test. We have to test the fact that timesheet list controller is doing its job. So most probably we're going to have to test the handle request. That's what it's, it's going to end up being the test. How do we do that? So we don't have to... We're going to have to go into our test package, right? And we're going to have to create a timesheet list controller test. Which, like the other tests, if you, if you remember, the other test, tests, they were all classes that extended from test case. You guys remember that? Timex Web. All right, so back to the timesheet list controller. I'm going to undo the stuff that I did here. I'm going to keep my map key because I'm going to need that. Right. And now let's take a look at the timesheet list controller. Now, one thing about unit tests that I didn't cover last week. Once you start building a whole bunch of tests, you start noticing that, wait a minute, I have to create all this stuff to be able to test something. And then once I have done my test, I have to undo that stuff that I originally started doing. In other words, the setup and the turn down, turn, 
turned down, turned down, of turned down of all the setup, right? Well, test case, the class that all our test classes extend from, they have already built in functions that allow you to do that. Hence, I introduce you guys to the setup function, which is actually a procedure, and the teardown procedure. Before you execute any test in a unit test class, the unit test framework will execute the setup and the teardown automatically for you. So that you don't have to do it for every single test. What is this what what is what is the benefit of this? What is this giving us? Well it's given us a way of concentrating just on the test. In other words the the function or or procedure that we create that is going to actually do the test would only need code concentrated on the test. It doesn't have to have code for preparing the test or tearing down the preparation of that test. So it's going to make our life easier. So from now on, if you guys need to prepare or set up your test, put it put that code in the setup function, in the setup procedure. And whenever you want to get rid of the stuff that you prepared or you set up, then you put that code into the teardown. All right, back to the issue at hand. We're trying to unit test timesheet list controller. So like every test, we're going to build our own main so that we can execute just this test, right? That's the whole idea about having a main. And what is the main going to do? It's going to call the unit test runner, and it's going to run suite. And our suite is just pretty much creating you know, a local suite with the timesheet list controller test, this class. And then what is it going to do? It's going to execute every function or procedure that has the word T or, or the letters T-E-S-T. -E Got it? You guys know that much. How do we test the handle request of the timesheet list controller? Well, first of all, you have to mock up an HTTP server request. Remember, the controller is the guy that receives the request from a browser. And what? how is that request done? That's done by the browser through HTTP protocol, a specific URL. So we have to mock up that. Like, it, like if a user just went into a browser and hit that. Okay? And hence, there is, as part of the unit test framework, I'm sorry, as part of the spring framework, there is something called a mock HTTP server request. Okay? And this is the benefit of the spring framework. We're starting to see all the benefits of the spring framework because the spring is very well integrated with unit testing, with hibernate, with all these different frameworks that we're using to build our website. So, Spring Framework has this mock HTTP server request. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to create a new one of those guys. And it's going to be a GET. Remember, we, we, can do a, um, we can do a POST or a GET. Well, we can do more than that, but typically it's either a POST or a GET. And then we're going to pass the URL timesheetlist.htm okay then we're going to do manually I mean this is all stuff manually we're going to build a new employee and we're going to set the employee ID of this new employee to a constant in this case 6 right I just created this constant call employee ID equals 6 
I'm creating an employee with that ID. Then I'm creating a new timesheet list controller. Look at this. This is all stuff. If you look at the code, this is all stuff that Spring automatically does for you behind the scenes in the real system that you do not have to do. Okay? But we're testing it. So we, we do not want to rely on, on Spring doing this, this stuff. We want to test it on our own. So we create a new timesheet list controller. Okay? And then what do we do? Look at this. Set timesheet manager to the timesheet manager that we just created. Oh, so we're creating a new timesheet manager. Look at this. See this? This is all stuff that Spring takes care of for you. And then we're doing the setter of the timesheet manager. And then here comes the real test. Timesheet list controller handle the request. And you're going to be passing the HTTP server request. And obviously the response is not built yet, so you pass no. The response is not built yet. Right after the call of that handle request, that's when you have to start asserting stuff. That's where the actual testing, the um, the code that tests the handle request should go. What's the first thing that you should test? The fact that the model in view cannot be null. I mean, you have to have a model in view. That's the whole purpose of the controller, to create a model in view. Okay? Not only that, the model in view has a model and a view. And they're both properties of the model in view class or object. So you can actually say, hey, get me the view, or hey, get me the model. With timesheet list controller, you know for a fact that the model cannot be null. There has to be a model. What is the model? Is the hash that I just talked to you about. That hash says I'm going to have a name called timesheets with a value that is a list of timesheets. Now, the list could be empty. I don't care. But the hash has to exist. The hash is the model. So that's the next assert that you do assert not null model in view dot get model. So in other words, the model of the model in view object cannot be null. Oh, but wait a second. I know my database. And I know that there are timesheets for employee ID 6. Do we have timesheets for employee ID 6? And go into the timesheets. Eh, how many timesheets do we have with employee ID 6? None. I guess we're going to have to do some setup work, right? So let's stop right there our test and let's jump into the setup. The setup needs to create a timesheet for employee ID 6. And that's exactly what we're doing here. We're actually building two timesheets for an employee ID 6. Now, never mind that employee ID 6 doesn't exist. Right? <laughs> it doesn't exist. But we can actually create timesheets for an employee that doesn't exist. Why? Because the referential integrity is taken care by Hibernate and not from the database or by the database. Remember I told you 
please do not, when you build your tables and you define your primary keys and foreign keys, do not define the foreign keys in the database because the database is going to try to do the referential integrity. In other words, that there's a match. Let Hibernate do that for you. So that's the reason why I can create this timesheet for employee ID 6. You know, it's from March 4, 2006, status pending, department IT, and uh, eight hours here and there, and then you just save it. You tell the timesheet manager to save it. And then you create another timesheet here, blah, blah, blah. And then you tell the timesheet manager to save it. And that's it. So you get back this timesheet ID. You don't know what it is. So you save it in here. Remember, that's automatically generated by the database, the timesheet ID. And that's the setup. So back to the tests. After we tell the timesheet list controller to handle that request, we know for sure how many timesheets we're supposed to get back, right? We know for sure. How many? Two. So we say, hey, model and view, get me the model and get me that map key. Remember the map key that you were talking you were asking me, hey, what well, what's that map key? It's a constant. Right? And it's static. That's why I can access it from anywhere. That constant is saying, hey, I have a name called timesheets. And you can ask the model to get the value of that name. How? You get the model out of the model in view, and then you say get, and then you pass the name. What are you getting back? You're getting back a list. You know that. So you cast it into a list, and you save it into this variable, timesheets. The first thing that you have to assert is that it's not null. Why? Because you know there are two timesheets. You created those two timesheets for that employee ID. It has to be not null. Next, we're actually going to traverse through the list. So we go into a for loop. Okay? And we get the first one. We cast it into a timesheet. And what do we do? We assert that the employer ID that we use to create those timesheets and that we use to handle the request, we assert that that employer ID is the same employer ID on each one of the timesheets. On each one of the timesheets. And then we're just going to do a system out, you know, print, hey, this test passed or whatever. You don't really need to, but. That's it. Yeah, which is not a good idea. Not a good idea. That's why, you know, what I would do is I will change that to the logging. And I'm going to sh show you guys later on how to do that stuff. Why don't we just make use of the logger that we have, remember the log4j, and log it. So if somebody wants detail logging, it will show that stuff. If somebody says, I don't want any logging, it will not show that stuff, even though the code is there. So let the logger decide. Um, let the logger decide when is it going to uh, print it out or not. So yes, I agree with you. I, it does not make sense to have a system out print line in there. All right. Now, what does the test involve? The test involved making sure that the model in view is not null, that the model inside the model in view is not null, that the timesheets that you get back are not null, and that the ID of each one of the timesheets, I'm sorry, the the employee ID 
of each one of the timesheets that you got back matches or is equal to the employee ID that you originally used to create those timesheets. Okay? <coughs> if any of these fail, the reason for any of these to fail is because the timesheet list controller could not handle the request. This is what the bottom line is. If any of these guys are no or you do not you do not get the um, the timesheets that you were supposed to get, then obviously something is wrong in the handle request of the timesheet list controller. And that's exactly what you want to test. Okay? Now you have to create you have created we, you have just created to run this test you have just created two timesheets that do not have an employee equivalent for them you gotta get rid of them you gotta clean up remember from last week I said you have to clean up so I introduce you to the teardown the teardown will get executed right after the test has completed regardless of whether it failed or not, by the way. And the teardown basically says, hey, timesheet manager, delete the timesheet with this ID and this ID, which you, you have previously saved just to make sure that, that you can delete them later on. That's it. You guys want to see it working? Notice that we did not use a we're not going to use a browser. We're not going to use um yeah, basically that's it. We're not going to use any browser. We're not going to use the um the hibernate or the spring or anything. And we just concentrated on the test that we want to Let's run it. So right click run as unit test. Let's expand the console. There you go. This is what you should get. You should get, you know, that Hibernate's being loaded, that the Hibernate mappings are being loaded, that the um, you know, all the stuff that it's required in order to then that the build session factory is it's loaded. And then a few look at this. See this? Insert. This is the test right here, inserting the first timesheet. And you see this second insert? This is the insert of the second timesheet. Okay? In fact, let's take a look at the oh here they are. These are all the parameters that are being passed. And then in here are the selects. And then at the end, the del deletes. This one takes care of deleting one, and this one takes care of deleting the other one. Cool. Now let's take a look at the JUnit interface. Whoa, it didn't pass. It did not pass. Expected six, but was one. Oh, that is correct. That is correct. You guys know why? We're trying to get the timesheets. We're trying. We're telling timesheet list controller to give us all the timesheets from employee one. But in our test, we're passing six. So in here, see this, a certain employee, the employee ID is 6, but the actual employee ID from the timesheet is 1. Can anybody tell me why it's 1? Do you guys remember timesheet list controller? <laughs> we hard code it the employee ID that we wanted our timesheets from. What's the reason that we hard-coded that? Well, right now, yeah, just to make something quicker and see that it, f it works, right? 
if we wanted the timesheets from employee D2, we just change the code in there too and then run it again. But that's not very <laughs> practical, right? Where should you get the ID from? And this is going back to how you're building your system and how the different users of your system will have different access to different stuff. Authentication. And this is something that this the reason why I have hard coded into employee one is because right now we have not touched authentication. In reality what should happen is the ID the employee ID should come from whoever is logged in. Oh, are you logged in? Oh, okay. I know who you are. You grab the ID from that employee and you, you inject it in there. And you get the timesheets for that person only. That's how it should be. So that the employee one is not able to see the timesheets from employee two. Or employee six is not able to see the timesheets for employee one. That's why our tests fail. So just to make our tests pass, okay? And this is a perfect example of tests verifying that the code is right. Right now the code is not right because we haven't touched authentication yet. So we can either do one of two things. We can hard code six in here in the timesheet list controller not a good idea because obviously we do not have that employee or we could hard code the employee ID to one in here okay if we do that we're actually creating two additional timesheets for that employee. And then at the end, we're getting rid of them. That's fine. That's fine. Okay? What I want to be able to uh, assert is that the employer ID from all the timesheets is equal to 1. Okay? So let's save it. Let's rerun the test. Take a look at the console. It did it. Now let's take at the J unit. It passed. And better yet, if we take a look at the timesheet table, I should not see anything different. No foreign timesheets that I don't know of. Got it? That's what you guys have to do for next week for your equivalent of timesheet list controller and for the one that you're turning in next week, which is the equivalent to enter hours controller.